Okay. Hello and welcome, everybody. Uh, we're about to get started here. And before we do, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping, a um, couple things to go through. Please uh, make sure that if you have any questions uh, throughout the presentation, that uh, you use the Q&A tool that's, I, I believe, on the right side of your screen. Um, if there are any technical issues, uh, please make sure to uh, click the question mark to get any answers. Uh, you can also throw them in the Q&A and we'll be able to help you there. Um, just for uh, um, bandwidth issues, if you've got any open applications, we recommend that you close those down so that you get a uninterrupted and clear picture of uh, my partner in crime, Eric, and I here as we get into uh, today's presentation, uh, which is entitled, Redefining Consumers Healthy Eating Habits is part of an industry superpowers um, series that we're conducting. And uh, this is Eric and I were just joking that this is the sixth installment of the Eric and Avi show uh, as we get into uh, the insights of the day. Hey, Eric, how are you, man? I'm doing good. Looking forward to it again, Avi, as always. It's a lot of fun and I, I appreciate the partnership um, and the work that our teams do together to do these. Um, yeah, thanks as well to everyone for joining us today. I'm delighted that you've chosen uh, to spend some time with us exploring, I'll call it the tension in consumers' lives between eating healthy and, well, you know, the alternative. So uh, very much looking <laughs> forward to it and uh, appreciative of the opportunity to, to serve the industry by bringing these insights to the market. So thanks, Avi. Awesome. Awesome. Cool. Well, t tell, us, uh, tell us for a quick second uh, about New Hope and, and what you guys are, are, are up to. Yeah, appreciate it. Yeah, many many people probably know New Hope, or at least they know Natural Products Expos East and West. Uh, my team and I at New Hope, we see it as our role to drive uh, responsible growth in the natural products, uh, natural and organic products industry. Uh, we love using marketplace insights mm -hmm. to create a voice for the market to help inform decision making for businesses in the industry. Ultimately, you know, it's it's my hope, it's my passion uh, that data and insights can help us build a strong and healthy uh, industry capable of bringing more health to more people. Uh, we love to see transformation in CPG and, and just how we serve community, planet, and consumers, of course. So, yeah, thanks. For awesome. That. Awesome. Yeah, of course, of course. And uh, I'm Avi Savar. I'm the president of Suzy. Uh, you know, we're a, we're a deep partner with with New Hope and, and excited to, to continue the great work we're doing together. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Suzy, we are a real time market research platform. Uh, we have a network of consumers and a suite of software tools to help you make better business decisions by getting real-time insights, uh, both qualitative and quantitatively. Um, all of the uh, information uh, and the data coming out of this uh, is a result of uh, New Hope's insights, as well as a, a study that we conducted um, with a sample size of about a thousand Americans um, and uh, census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. Uh, and this study was conducted not too long ago, just a, a less than a couple, about a couple weeks ago. So kind of fresh, fresh off the, hot off the presses as, as they would say. Um, so let's kind of, let's, let's dive in here and, and, and talk a little bit about this um, tension that Eric uh, mentioned. And, and, and there's certainly a lot of it. And we're going to get into some really uh, um, meaty insights, uh, no pun intended there. So um, f first kind of, you know, every every um, good presentation starts with some provocative statement. Um, I don't know if we're headed or headed for a healthy revolution or if we're in the middle of a healthy revolution. Um, at the end of the day, um, it's a provocative statement. But but one way or another, if you surf the net or you watch TV, uh, you would think that, you know, healthy eating is everywhere and we're surrounded by it. Um, and that may be the case uh, because at the end of the day, there are more and more options uh, that, that, that are available to us and, and, and consumers more broadly um, as, you know, it's been a record year for the organics product industry, which grew almost 13% in uh, 2022. So, you know, you would think that it is, in fact, a revolution here. Um, but despite all of that hype, when you kind of dig into consumer behavior, um, people are still struggling, right? So there is a little bit of a paradox, if you will, um, in, 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 the, um, in this subject specifically. Uh, and that natural tension is kind of this push and pull. I kind of jokingly say this is like the devil and the angel on our shoulders, so to speak, um, that, that balances between what's good for me and what am I craving, 
Um, you know, so so co this constant push and pull between the, the, the two personalities on either shoulder um, that's telling us what we want versus what we should do. Uh, and I think that's going to be a lot of the tension that we're going to explore uh, today. So this is what we're going to be talking about, right? The unpacking the, the, the paradox of healthy eating um, and digging into the consumer behavior and data that's driving some of these decisions that are getting made in the market uh, and some of the behaviors and patterns that we're going to uh, ultimately explore. Uh, and, and those are kind of threefold, I think, as you start to think about um, what drives behavior. We all have kind of ultimately good inten intentions. Uh, you know, we, we, we want to achieve and we want to uh, do the right things. That's the kind of the angel on, 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 on one shoulder. Uh, and then this kind of internal struggle that we have uh, between doing the right thing um, and then how we can ultimately change behavior or shift our behavior and how you as brands can ultimately be a catalyst, frankly, for helping to empower consumers um, in this little bit of a paradoxical struggle between what they want and what they're doing. Um, there's a natural place potentially for brands to play. There's a natural place for messaging and packaging and behavior um, that um, that hopefully will 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 you know kind of shine some insights on. So good intentions, Eric. Talk yeah. to me. <laughs> good intentions. Yeah, it's really interesting that you set it up as the the good and the evil. And uh, I describe it a slightly different way. Not that I don't like that one. I think that looks really well. But for so much of history, I mean, our, our relationship with food is so complex. For most of human history, food has simply been about survival, getting enough calories to survive and, you know, do the work that you need to do it in our industrialized society for many. And I don't want to. Um, Gosh, I, I don't want to overstate privilege. For many people, it is still about survival. But for a lot of consumers, we're going through this transition where food can be about optimization. Food can be about living a life of vitality. Food can be about indulgence. And I think that puts us in this really interesting place where there's some real tension as our relationship with food grows even more complex from simple survival for many, for simple survival to for many of us having food kind of be a luxury, something we have a lot of choice over and a lot of w different ways to engage in. But that creates challenge in how consumers engage with it. So in many ways, the um, paradox, the, the tension we're going to talk about in market research terms, you know this, Avi, but, you know, for all of our audience, apparent paradox in consumer behavior or obvious tension in attitudes and beliefs are amazing places to search for marketplace insights and opportunities. So when it comes to eating healthy, people have good intentions. Let's take a look and let's set up uh, the paradox that we're going to be talking about and exploring today. First, we see that 38% of consumers set healthy eating goals for themselves. This is a top two box uh, on a seven point scale. Maybe interesting, only 15% of people kind of disagreed in that bottom two box. So there's a good chunk of people who are setting goals and doing something kind of in the middle. Maybe they're occasionally setting goals. Maybe they've got some aspirations. They wouldn't quite goals, but people spend a lot of time thinking about food and setting goals around them. Um, the U.S. consumer also sees the benefit of a healthy diet. Between 7 and 10 or 8 and 10 consumers agree that a healthy diet can have a positive impact on their bodies, can help them live longer, and can have a positive impact on their mental state. That's probably newer, people thinking about uh, food as having a bigger impact on them than just uh, what might you might think of as physical health. Further, 52% of people set healthy eating goals around important events such as uh, New Year's, summertime, vacations, and birthdays. And how we work to achieve those goals seems to be changing in the marketplace. In society today, health is defined as more than just body weight, and a healthy diet is now not always the same as dieting. Today, the focus on diet and lifestyle are not necessarily strict crush uh, crash diets to meet those sort of summertime uh, goals or those New Year's resolutions. And it's not strictly about calorie counting. But weight loss remains a focal point for many people's health goals. Uh, another recent study that New Hope did found that 45% of consumers believe weight is one of their biggest health concerns overall. Here we see a modern take on diet and dieting. Noom leverages smartphone apps um, and approaches to dieting focused on behavior and lifestyle change, not just calorie counting, designed to help consumers make longer-term lifestyle shifts um, overall. 
Social media, of course, plays a role in how we consume uh, information about food today. Maybe not the food itself, but social media is a source of motivation. Unfortunately, uh, like any other source of media, this can come in the form of unrealistic beauty expectations, but it can also be a positive source of motivation and inspiration for healthy lifestyle, eating, and recipes. Nearly a third of consumers today uh, look to social media to motivate uh, healthy eating in their lives. This appears to create an opportunity for dietitians and maybe brands working with dietitians in a social media space to play a positive role in educating and motivating uh, diet and lifestyle changes. We pick out dietitians because of a recent study, again, uh, that we have that also shows that 28% of consumers, that's kind of amazing. This is the third most trusted form of information, source of information for health and wellness. That's dietitians. So this is highest among Gen Z and millennials, which leads me to kind of connect the dots between social media and dietitians and say, maybe it is this group of influencers, not just any influencers, but educated, knowledgeable dietitians in the space that have a real outsized opportunity to influence and and help shape social norms and food and lifestyle choices that consumers are making today. Uh, two thirds of respondents today follow a healthy diet, um, at least half of their meals. This is possibly leading to the success of healthier chain restaurants like Sweetgreen, uh, the salad chain that's planning their IPO for later this year. All right. So, so far so good, right? Uh, we promised a paradox and tension as a basis for today's insights, but it seems like people are doing pretty well. Uh, it's important to note as well that we saw in our study less than 10% of respondents follow a healthy diet at every meal. Not that we necessarily expect people to, but I think that's one of the insights. Consumers are both eating healthy and not eating healthy at the same time. We also seen uh, in research that 54% of consumers report being, only 54% report being satisfied with their health and 55% say that they're always looking for ways to be healthier while also saying 50% that living a healthy lifestyle can be frustrating. So goals or no goals, uh, good intentions or not, the reality for no, most consumers is a bit of a paradox. Eating healthy isn't a full-time commitment. Being healthy is hard. Living a healthy lifestyle can be stressful. And many, for many, it can be downright frustrating. Um, with that, tell us a little bit more about the struggle, Avi. Yeah, man, this is like the story of my life right here, the honest struggle, back and forth, trying to figure out how to, how to do things the right way, but, but um, balance that with you know, what you want. And, um, you know, I think that struggle applies to more things than just food, but we'll keep it we'll keep it to that topic for 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 today here. Um, you know, when we kind of get into some of the nuances of this honest struggle, if you will, at least a third, you know, almost over a third of our respondents said that it is, in fact, hard. Right. And the struggle is very real for them. Um, and and if you go even deeper for certain segments of, of the population, it's even harder. Right. The struggle is deeper for some. Women especially tend to associate some negative emotions when uh, thinking or talking about healthy eating. Words like stress, anxiety, exhaustion were some that they used to describe, you know, kind of how they feel about the topic. And, you know, I think that demonstrates a little bit of that struggle of, you know, you want to do the right thing, but it's really hard when, when, when there's a lot of baggage and a lot of association and a lot of stress that, that kind of comes along with it. Um, so you kind of go a little bit deeper and, and, and we kind of distilled it down to two, two areas, if you will, right? When it comes down to it, the two hardest parts of trying to eat healthy came down to willpower and motivation, right? Those two things um, were really the driving forces overwhelmingly um, are what bubbled to the top, right? Willpower and motivation. So let's talk about that. Like, you know, what, what, what does that mean for you as a brand? Do you have permission as a brand to help enter this narrative? Um, and if so, what are some opportunities that you can use to enter this conversation in kind of a natural and, and organic way that, that's, that's relevant? Because, you know, the reality is the consumer is unequivocally saying yes, like, they, they need this type of content. They are looking for this type of um, uh, empowering uh, narrative to be part of their lives. And, and if you as a brand can align to it, then, then you do have the permission to kind of enter this narrative, right? It, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit in a second about kind of this noble purpose that a brand may have that allows them the, the, the or gives them the permission to authentically enter this narrative. But I would say absolutely if your if your values and messages in a brand align 
you do have permission. Um, one other area that that, that kind of did bubble up that that's an opportunity here to talk about is this concept of of cravings. Um, Thirty three percent of our respondents, you know, haven't tried a healthy diet because they fear they have too many cravings, um, and that tends to be a roadblock for a lot of people. And you know, the reality is, if you kind of just look around. Uh, that one topic alone can fill an entire bookcase in our homes, this concept of craving. And so it's, it's not, um, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's definitely a, uh, a, a topic that's, that's prevalent, uh, and it's something that is consistent as it relates to this struggle and this paradox that we've been, you know, kind of talking about. Um, what is it that people crave? Um, I found this to be kind of fun and interesting. People are most likely to crave sweets. But when, when you kind of think about it in the context of drinking alcohol, it shifts to more salty snacks, right? And this is kind of what our consumer uh, uh, panel told us about what it is specifically that they're craving. The other thing that I found uh, pretty interesting is uh, don't mess with their cheese, chocolate, or red meat, because those are three things that they say they're not willing to give up, um, which I found to be pretty interesting. And, and so the question becomes, you know, how do they, I guess, modulate this type of, or, or these categories so that they're not eliminated or that they're, uh, they're ultimately entered into their, um, into their diets, but done so in, in a way that's kind of moderated. Um, the other thing that, you know, if you just look at the data, right, the cheese category alone is pretty massive. So, you know, that, that's a, it's a monster category. Um, it's here to stay. And if you go back to the last slide, you can say it's one of those three, the three cravings uh, or three uh, um, uh, food groups that, that this consumer group did, just said no way, right, um, which I found to be super, super interesting. Other than cravings, and I think this is an area that, that deserves some further exploration is, 42% of the people we talked to said cost is a prohibitive factor to eating healthy, right? Um, I think that's a pretty big, big number when you look at it. Um, and the fact of, of, of the matter is that like broader access to healthy food options, right, is something that's necessary in the world, right? And some could call that a noble purpose that there are certain brands that might be able to own or enter uh, that they may not be thinking about, right? That That's potential opportunity to open up your addressable market in a pretty profound way. Um, and, you know, the question is, like, can brands save the day by help making, you know, eat, healthy eating more affordable? And, and, you know, I would argue for another pun that there's definitely appetite, right? That low-cost healthy food options are necessary, um, not just in growing the category, but also beginning to shift the paradox into, into something that's a lot more approachable for a lot more people. So that kind of brings us to, to the next piece of the equation. And Eric, why don't you tell us a little bit about the empowering shifts, the three empowering shifts they're seeing. Yeah. Yeah. First on those cravings, um, I'm pretty sure someone on the design team was craving donuts and pastries because there was an outsized representation of donuts in our, in our uh, cravings conversation there in the imagery. Totally. totally. <laughs> um, yeah. So, really on topic here more empowering the the empowering shifts so you know uh, what are the big super trends that we're seeing shaping the landscape in some ways in response to this tension and and where is the marketplace going a little bit as we think about the landscape for and the discussion of health and healthy in the marketplace at New Hope, we monitor innovation trends for the CPG industry as they manifest through our Natural Products Expo uh, shows. And so effectively, what this gives us is a view into how many of the smallest, most nimble businesses are responding to changing marketplace opportunities and demands in the marketplace. When we look across the 15 macro forces that we track, the 60 trends and the hundreds of different sub trends each year, what we see are three cultural forces that kind of describe or categorize all of those trends into three big buckets. Um, through these cultural forces, Avi and I are going to explore the impact of how modern life, empowered communities, we'll define these in a second, and holistic health are ha having an influence on the marketplace overall and how they help us think about the types and the patterns innovation that we're seeing. So. Looking for patterns in innovation, uh, one can find a pattern in innovation, innovators responding to the pros and the cons of modern life. In our always-on, internet-enabled interconnectedness, our exposure to global mm -hmm. cuisines and cultures and the evolution of technology, we see consumers and innovators relying on modern technology in order to improve their lives and their eating habits. 
people, of course, are looking to the Internet, uh, and the Internet plays a role um, in sort of uh, helping consumers navigate healthy eating. 63% are using the Internet for recipes and cooking ideas. 40% are, are using it to look up uh, healthy eating content, and roughly that same number who are looking for information on brands in this space. People are searching for recipes that are tailored to their health goals. What you see here is the relative search terms and search volume, sorry, search volume for search terms and the cyclical patterns tied to those kind of interesting on its own. For the search term, healthy, healthy recipes in the yellowish orange color and recent growth of keto recipes right alongside sort of declining and lower absolute levels for paleo and whole 30. So consumers are looking for targeted information that's tied to their goals and how they're pursuing health. Um, are your brands, I'd ask many of people here to think about, are your brands well aligned with what consumers will learn and also what they're searching for online when they start searching health concerns or looking for healthy eating content in the marketplace? Something to think about. Um, as we mentioned, modern life has its pros and cons. Nearly a third of respondents, 31%, feel negative emotions when they're looking up healthy eating online, when they're looking for emo uh, and uh, experiencing emotions ranging from uh, being overwhelmed to anxious, and that is coming from a result of engaging with this paradox, this understanding of, of what is healthy and how do I define that and how do I engage in that? And knowing that that emotion exists is a clue for brands to think about, well, what emotion might I be created, creating as consumers learn about my brand and how well I'm serving their health needs? Mm -hmm. 47% of respondents say that they're using online tools to help them achieve their goals. Um, health apps, technology companies, and dietary supplement companies, some of them playing in the personalized nutrition space, are responding to some of these needs in the market where consumers are looking for this information. They're looking for help. On the Google Play Store, you see the My Fitness app. Uh, My Fitness Pal app has over 50 million downloads and boasts a community of over 200 uh, million members. Um, I would ask myself, like, how will food apps and online tools make consumers feel about your products and their nutritionals um, with this increased transparency? These food tools are showing people side by side comparisons of one product versus another, and they're engaging then in that emotion and that goal state. How do your products stack up? Are you meeting people's needs? And are you recognizing, again, sort of the high transparency environment and the lens through which many consumers will be evaluating products today as they engage these products? About half of respondents are using tools to help them achieve their health goals. And conversely, half aren't. Um, what I say here is there appears to be sizable opportunity to create better tools, to create better psychology and approaches to behavior change, motivation and behavior reinforcement to engage more deeply those who are using these tools and maybe those who are not. And again, think about how does your brand intersect with these tools as a critical way of saying, am I meeting consumers needs today? Uh, why don't you take us through empowered communities? Yeah, absolutely. So another kind of area of opportunity, if you will, right? And, and almost going back to that noble purpose, there, there are groundswells happening at a grassroots level. And if you see just the overall kind of growing frustration over corporate apathy and, and government inaction, there's there's a lot of movement towards kind of taking ownership and, and, and solving environmental and nutritional health issues by entrepreneurs and communities at large, right? So, so when you think about that, Right. The idea here is many, many consumers don't look at healthy eating just about being good for you, meaning good for me, the individual. They are also looking at it and associating it to the idea of good for everyone. Right. And almost half the people we talked to felt that that strong sense of, you know, kind of loyalty to brands that source sustainably are really important. And so it's almost bigger than just the impact that it has on me as an individual. It's also about the community that I'm a part of, the people I care about and what it is that I want to align to, what my values align to um, as it relates to the community that I belong in. And I think that's a very powerful concept. Um, the top two factors that surfaced animal welfare and kind of pesticide free those those two had the largest impact on consumer buying behavior in terms of how they are, are choosing or what factors are influencing their choice in the brands and products that they bring into their homes and that they consume um and here just an example one example of a brand uh, boom who, who who partners with minority sugarcane farmers 
and and has a a, a very overt miss, mission of you know radically positive environmental impact like literally those are the words on the page radically positive environmental impact um and that and they put that front and center as part of their go to market as part of of their overall mission as an organization um and i i use them as an example because they hit on all of these buckets the top actions associated with brands that have sustainable business practices um, and those three top areas are protecting the environment, the balance of people, planet, and profit, and transparency in production, right? And so those are, are, are three of the top um, attributes or ideas that really surfaced as it related to what it is that consumers are connecting to the mission of a brand that aligns back to who they are as an individual. And I found that to be a very powerful um, idea. Um, you know, when, when we do think uh, about the connection of, of brand values, your, your noble purpose, if, you're, if, you're truly, you're, if your noble purpose is, is true and, and authentic, because consumers can smell that a mile away, if it isn't, then there is a clear growing opportunity to use those brand values to attract people to healthy eating. Um, and, and that kind of aligns that idea of communities and empowerment and not just being about good for me, but being about good for the world. And I think that's a real area of opportunity that brands can explore. Talk to us about uh, holistic health and well-being. Yeah. Yeah. You, you got to talk about my favorite topic. I'm, I'm to me, it's just uh, so enriching to know that brands and businesses are, are working differently um, in, in serving the, the market opportunity and, you know, engaging consumers in that way. And holistic health is great as well. Just a quick plug, um, submit some questions. You know, um, Avi yeah. and I are in a really good pace to having a good chunk of time to answer questions. And honestly, that can be one of the most fun parts of this. So if you've got any kind of question about this, uh, drop it in to the tool and we'll have time to, to answer those in a second. So. Awesome. Uh, yeah, let's talk about our final cultural force uh, that is shaping innovation in natural products and larger CPG industry overall. That's holistic health and well-being. This this macro trend, uh, cultural trend, kind of represents the shift from reactive treatment of health conditions to proactive management of well-being, the shift from piecemeal health approaches to holistic ones, and the shift from avoiding disease to living a life of vitality. A little bit of that paradox I described before of going from treating food and lifestyle choices as these sort of very survival things to being able to enrich ourselves in a very different way and how we choose to engage. Consistent with this observation of innovation patterns in the market, we can see in our consumers' research as well, this shift towards more holistic health and wellness goals. When we ask consumers to identify the top three reasons why they're motivated to eat healthy, we see general wellness and being more energetic emerge as the top two reasons people say, this is why I'm eating healthy. This is not um, you know, basic needs and this is not sort of addressing specific health conditions. This is kind of that life of vitality idea. A perfect example of this is uh, both the cultural popularity and I'd say the notoriety of Goop. Uh, loved by many, but also the butt of many jokes about what many people see as sort of over the top health and lifestyle advice and products uh, featured on Goop, playing that role of, of both being sort of advocate and foil for many people because it has become such a cultural phenomenon. For years, we've talked about the rise of food as medicine, not in a fully literal manner of speaking, but as both the rise of nutrition as an important part of health and wellness and treatment, but also through the functionalization of food to help accomplish specific health goals. So here we see this manifest in the number, 47% of consumers seeing health food as part of self-care in their lives. Um, in this space, uh, in the face of growing levels of stress in our lives, for example, New Hope found in another recent study we did uh, that 53% of Gen Z consumers pick stress management as one of the biggest health concerns that they have in their life. That's 31 points higher than that of boomers. Maybe with age, you have more health concerns, but this massive gap among uh, Gen Zs and millennials that stress is sort of this major contributor to, to concern in life is, is something we're responding to culturally. In response to this stress, there's a growing self-care trend that has consumers seeking solutions to the intensity of life today. 
Uh, for some, the solution is found in balance, in giving oneself permission to be human and imperfect, uh, to practice acceptance and to embrace that imperfection. And in the world of food, sometimes just being a little bit permissive and saying it doesn't always have to be about healthy food all the time. 58% of people also consider comfort food as part of self-care. So this can help us explain that paradox uh, of consumers both seeking healthy food and comfort or indulgent food at the same time in the same meal, definitely within the same day and week. There's a gender gap, though, uh, in this and how people perceive it. Men are most likely to eat healthy foods when they're thinking about self-care, 52% for men versus 41% among women, and women the opposite. They're more likely to think about comfort foods when thinking about self-care relative to men, 63, 52 in that particular case. So interesting dynamic to think about there. Um, and there's compromised foods as well. Over half of respondents think of the superfood dark chocolate as a comfort food. Unfortunately, nutrition science is hard and our research and media often drag consumers through the confusing ups and downs and the sensational headlines proclaiming one day that chocolate and wine are good for you and the next that they're the worst thing you could possibly put into yourself. Um, it's no wonder in response to that, that sometimes consumers are turning away from the headlines and towards trends like ancient wisdom and intuitive eating to take a step away from the stress and the uncertainty caused by the food choices that we have to make every day in the context of the goals and the desire to live and eat healthy. So within this tension hides another brand opportunity. Can we make healthy food feel more like comfort food? Can we give people healthier choices where they are indulging and feeding themselves well? Many brands are trying uh, to stake that, strike that balance between better for me, better for the planet, maybe better for communities all at the same time that Avi had talked about uh, that consumers are looking for today. Here are two examples of brands trying to deliver against sort of that consumer preference for better for you snacking. Uprising is using a mix of almond flours and egg whites to deliver a keto friendly, uh, currently seen as healthy, high fat, high protein, uh, you know, low net carb snack chip. And Wild taking an entirely different approach, delivering a grain-free, potato-free, nut-free, dairy-free snack product by literally using chicken breast and pork to make these uh, wild um, high-protein, I guess they're calling them wild-protein chips. So uh, with that, I'll pass it back to you, Avi, to, to take us home. Yeah, ab absolutely. So that was, you know, obviously a, a lot to cover. We, we did it in a short amount of time. And, and as uh, Eric mentioned, if you guys have questions, please throw them into the Q&A and, and we'll get to them in, in, in just a minute. Um, but just a kind of a quick recap here before we get to the Q&A, right? Brands can do a lot to help save the day. There's a lot of tension that exists with consumers around healthy eating. We've covered a lot of that. And as a brand, yes, there is a lot you can do, and there are opportunities to engage uh, in different ways. Uh, first, you know, we talked about tools. More than half the respondents don't use tools to help them achieve their goals, and there's clearly some white space there potentially um, for, for brands to enter. So how, how do you build tools that that people can adopt into their healthy eating habits or the lifestyle? Are there existing tools that you can integrate with, tools that you can create yourself? Um, there may be some opportunities there to, 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 to bridge the gap or bridge the tension, if you will, um, with specific consumers or specific consumer segments. Um, willpower and motivation, we talked about that, right? That is kind of the great paradox, ultimately summed up in, in two key struggles. 45% um, of the people we talked to struggle with willpower, 40% struggle with motivation. So this idea of inspiration, how do you inspire people to make healthy eating um, decisions or how to integrate those habits into their lives? Another area of opportunity and when you think about the key insights or the key kind of um, behavioral insights around willpower and motivation that, that folks are struggling with, that's a place that uh, a brand can, can think about how to organically um, enter that conversation. Um, and, then, and then really the la last piece is, you know, kind of cost and access. 42% of the people um, we talk to struggle with healthy eating because of cost. So how do we make healthy eating more affordable, right? I think the idea of, of, um, of accessibility um, is a big one. And if, if there is a lower cost option for you as a brand to provide, um, it may be worth considering, right? It may be something that does open up your addressable market 
and gives you an opportunity to talk to consumers that you know were never in your consideration set before and, and actually begin to create your own groundswell. And I think that's an interesting opportunity for, for brands to, um, to, to think about as they go into this kind of next phase of growth. Um, and, you know, th there's a lot more to cover. Um, that was kind of a, a, a nice high level. We'll make sure that everybody who um, uh, attended this webinar and registered for this webinar gets a copy of, of the, the report and the deck. Um, so we'll kind of pause there and start with some Q&A. And, and hopefully we'll have some time to, to get into uh, these. Are, this is always kind of a fun part of the uh, fun part of the show. Uh, so the Q&A uh, is starting to fill up. Please feel free to ask uh, more questions, drop them into the queue, and we'll start to get to them. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me pick one randomly here. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, 28% respondents trusted dietitians. Are there other entities they find trustworthy? Um, I don't know if our, if our report or our data actually explored that, but, uh, you know, Eric, any, any thoughts there in terms of what other um, – uh, trustworthy sources there there might be for consumers out there. We talked about yeah, you know yeah. media news having like a little bit of that same split personality, and you know I think you know I, I tend to agree with that. It's kind of hard to know what to believe anymore when you read it. So I think this is a very um, kind of timely question, frankly. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I, I snuck that, that stat in from a study that we had just completed, obviously. So, that, so that's why you hadn't seen that one. Uh, sure. Literally hot off the presses as well. I love it. Um, you know, friends and family are, is really, really high on that list. I mean, it's, it's, again, it's recommendations. It's who can I trust when we asked, you know, uh, consumers about that. It was, it, it ranked as doctors and physicians as, as highest friends and family, um, following just below the dietitian's number um, and some professional resources. Um, uh, let's see here, you know, the Wikipedia's WebMDs of the world and pharmacists. Those were the top of our of our list for the for the average. Oh, interesting. Yep. That's interesting. So for friends, family and, and professionals, right? Pharmacists, maybe nutritionists, et cetera. That's yep. good. And that was broadly yeah. health and wellness, not specifically food. But yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, let's see. Um, Edward asked, how do you see plant-based foods in the world of healthy eating? Are people embracing plant-based foods in their healthier lifestyles, or are you seeing these foods still be morally motivated? What are your thoughts on that, Eric? It's definitely up yeah. your alley. Yeah, yeah. And I know you, you've got an opinion on this, too, from, from some prior conversations. But yeah. two pieces here, morally motivated, yes. And I would say what one of the really powerful things that's been happening in the plant-based food space is uh, some could say there's been a degradation of the, you know, the focus of plant-based foods, if you would, the vegan or vegetarian community, because that was traditionally a very morally motivated sort of group of consumers. Mm -hmm. but, but the opportunity that I think we see in the marketplace where some would say as high as 33, 36% of consumers who kind of fall into that flexitarian eating less meat, considering plant-based sort of bucket – um, which is way bigger than the 7 to 11% who might self-identify as vegan or vegetarian, that, that bigger opportunity space is really represented by moral decisions, but also the um, inclusion of other entry points into the plant-based food movement that allow consumers to engage in that through uh, social concerns about you know, how workers are being treated in, in meat plants or concerns about that, um, concerns about environmental health, concerns about the use of antibiotics or hormones, you know, within um, within our food production systems. And, and so there's a lot of entry points now that kind of lead consumers in some ways to the plant-based or the flexitarian sort of choices that they're making today. Um, and so, yes, morally, and also a lot of other things as, as well. Um, and maybe I forgot Eric, the first part of the question. I'll have to go back to it. But Let me, let me ask you a question um, uh, just to kind of dive a little deeper on that. Do you think that there is confusion or any confusion in the marketplace about all of these various choices. It seems like there's a lot of choice with a lot of definitions and a lot of terminology that, you know, I never saw when I was growing up. Uh, they're all new. Um, and so, I, I mean, more anecdotally than anything else, I'd be curious to know your thoughts. Like, is it confusing to the consumer to even understand to some degree what their choices are and what they should be thinking about for their own lifestyle, like the difference yeah. between all of these different, you know, options and, and what they're all about. Plant-based, non-plant-based, yeah. non-keto. I mean, there's a, like, it's, it's a limitless list of words. 
Yeah, I don't I don't know if it's more or less confusing. We have the benefit of having a lot more information at our fingertips. And therefore, we also have the benefit of an overwhelming amount of information and ideas and opinions at our fingertips. And so it's a double edged sword, as is any technology. Right. And so I do think that there is a lot of opportunity for people to have stronger held opinions about, you know, things based on, you know, good and bad information that they're going to find, um, but also to become overwhelmed. And I think that's where some of the emotion is that we've been talking about today is that consumers are entering into this different relationship with food. And now they're expected in some cases to think about the environmental impact and not just, you know, does it taste good or is it good for me? But I'm supposed to be thinking about the workers. I'm supposed to be thinking about the environment as well. And yeah, there's a lot of confusion. And back to the plant-based yeah. space, I do think that it is important, has an important role in healthy eating and at the same time, there's also a bifurcation within plant-based where plant-based could be eating more out of the produce department, or it could be eating more engineer engineered foods, you know, that replicate meats. And I think there's a, a space and a role for both in serving different objectives. But that idea that there's so many different objectives, I could eat for one of any number of different purposes, and I could choose based on any one of different missions or higher order purposes. And that that does create confusion and uncertainty for consumers. It also creates passion and engagement. Yeah. Um, we just have to navigate all of that now. It's interesting. Yeah, it's 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 very true. I mean, I think I think as as part of any um, business segment over time, right? As more attention and more popularity and more options come in. Um, it starts to to polarize, but at the same time, it becomes more mainstream, right? So you start to think about, you know, what segment of the population um, speaks to what type of product, uh, and and it starts to really, um, it, it could create confusion in the marketplace, uh, but at the same time, it also means that the category in of itself is growing, right? It's it the opportunities are there for um, brands to have different types of conversations with different types of consumer groups. Um, which is actually a good segue yeah. into Megan's questions. It, it, it's okay. easy to go to the aspirational definition of healthy eating, but many consumers are just trying to make small step changes. How can brands or retailers support small step changes in the majority of consumers journey to healthy eating? I think that's a, a great question because, you know, it, it's, it's like a one day at a time for most consumers, right? Um, you know, m many of whom are just trying to get through the day. Um, and trying not to, you know, screw it up, so to speak. And I think that's part of that. Par I know for me specifically, that is part of the paradox. You know, when you go through a busy day, you don't have a lot of time. You want to grab something quick. Um, it's, you know, always easier to grab something unhealthy than healthy. So, you know, I would say anecdotally, and I'll let uh, Eric chime in as well here. For me, I would argue that as a brand, you kind of need to understand what those step changes are. You need to understand kind of the, the patterns, the behaviors, the the um, the routines of the types of customers that you're trying to engage with and help try to add value along the way, knowing that different types of consumer groups face different types of struggles. Um, I used to joke a lot back in the day about, you know, what I called the 6 a.m. test. You know, uh, a, a, a lot of brands like to talk about their features and their benefits, which obviously is important. But when, you know, mom or dad or whoever wakes up at six o'clock in the morning, they're not thinking to themselves what you know particular feature or benefit they're looking for. They're just trying to get through the day um, and get through that long laundry list of, of to-dos and make sure that they're home at, at, at a certain time so that they can spend time with their family. All of those things add up. And so really understanding the nuances of, of consumers' patterns and behaviors by segment um, and then figuring out how you can naturally integrate into those um, uh, specific points in their life, I think is, is really important. It's also the, where art and science kind of meet in terms of how you are articulating your brand promise to those specific people. Um, Eric, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on Megan's question. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love, I love your ex example. And I think the small steps is, is really important and powerful. I mean, if we think about behavior change, a lot of the popular psychology on behavior change right now is have a, have a big aspiration, have a goal, have a, a clear sense of what you want to accomplish and where you want to get, and then focus day to day on what are the small behavior changes that I can implement and replicate that aren't trying to, you know, go vegan all at once and like change everything. Yeah. But like, how can I make these smaller changes towards healthier? And I think there's opportunities for brands all over the place. I think this is part of what you were saying, Avi, is how do I carve out ownership of a part of that process? How do I 
rebrand Fisher Nuts, you know, in in a compelling yeah. and a powerful way that says, and here's a great snacking option. Yeah, it's going to satisfy that desire for a salty snack, and it's filling and full of fiber and protein and healthy fats. And you know, how do we re-engage consumers? I think in some core foods or position products around just that, those smaller steps towards better. And how can how close can we get products that meet those needs for consumers to whole, you know, Michael Paul, uh, Pollan sort of idea of, you know, real food and whole foods um, in, in that process. I think there's opportunity there for sure. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, I actually just finished uh, about a month ago, a book uh, by a gentleman named James Clear called Atomic Habits. And it's really about this idea of like the very small changes that ladder up to big changes, right? And and the things that we can control happen in the minutia. Um, or I think it's kind of fascinating. It's, it's a little bit of a sidebar, but but I do think that there's opportunity to understand what are those micro behaviors um, and how you know your product and your brand can kind of naturally enter that 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 um, narrative, if you will. Um, all right, let's and it see. creates what an else, opportunity. What else? provide relief, right? I mean, think about yeah. marketing. If you can exist at that point of tension and provide relief for people, the kind of relief to the tension we've talked about today, here's a small, easy thing to do. That's marketing That's right. gold. Sorry, but you know, it is. I agree. I, I, and especially when it comes, you know, when you just general health at large, right? It's like fitness and eating are the two main components. Um, when it comes to fitness, it's like I either worked out today or I didn't. But when it comes to eating, you're making dozens of choices throughout a particular day as it relates to what it is that you consume. Um, and you might have an unhealthy breakfast, but a healthy lunch. Those are two distinct choices that you're making. Um, and you're going to have plenty more throughout the rest of the day. So just because you kind of screwed it up in the morning doesn't mean you can't have, you know, a, a good habit or, or a good activity happen later. So those choices are happening frequently. And especially as it relates to food, they're happening regularly. Um, and they're happening every day, which I think gives you more and more opportunities to kind of engage uh, with, with within. And and just because you made a bad choice, you know, for breakfast today, doesn't mean you can't make a good choice for breakfast tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, all right, the questions are kind of coming in here. Uh, oh, can you repeat the name of the book about little changes? Yes, uh, Ro, it's called Atomic Habits, uh, and the author is a gentleman named James Clear. Uh, I also subscribe to his uh, newsletter. It's one of the best, uh, like little. Thursday nuggets of information I get in my inbox uh, just about, you know, how you can mentally approach the little things in your life that you need to do to, you know, be more productive and, and uh, you know, function at a higher level, which I find to be um, a challenge. Um, you're very welcome, Ro. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's, let's keep going here. I'll pick some random ones here. Um, uh, Elizabeth, uh, how are consumers interpreting engineered food as good for me? Uh, offset this against the desire for unprocessed foods, which equal wellness. Um, uh, Eric, this might be all you, um, given that I don't really have that much of a of an understanding of of engineered foods and and how or how or if they are good for you or not. So I'll let you take this yeah. one. Yeah, you know it's a it's a challenging question, Elizabeth. Um, and there's probably no easy answer. I think that consumers live in paradox with this this thing. You know, I think that there is a growing sense that less processed food is is you know better for you. The closer to fresh, the closer to whole foods are 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 better. And at the same time, um, we have we are challenged by what consumers know how to cook and are comfortable use and used to eating and what they can easily feed their family and, and other things. And um, I think that the engineered some of the engineered meat alternatives, some of the other engineered foods that are out there, the highly processed is kind of how I'm defining engineered here, um, really play a role in consumers' lives. And I think ultimately the hope is, you know, if you, if you really think about uh, more health for more people, which is our, our mission as a company, we need to be stepping people towards those little habits of eating more healthy, you know, less processed, cleaner foods. Um, and we also need to recognize the stresses and strains that Avi's acknowledged in people's lives and, and how people we get there. So there's a role for both in creating behavior change and solving environmental problems and and just helping people get through day to day. And so it's a paradox many consumers will live with. And I think very often I hear companies talk about, you know, one or the other and, you know, which is better. And and it's it that's great and that's good brand positioning. And recognize that in the consumer, the black and white 
that doesn't exist for them. They live in the gray with regards to many of these topics and how do you best position whatever product you have as a solution to them. I would say be clear about the goal. Maybe sometimes the goal of an engineered product isn't so much about the health, but it is if, if you're beyond meat. It's about solving problems in the animal food supply chain. It's about solving environmental problems um, and about you know maybe smaller steps towards healthier eating as well. Just as an example. Absolutely right. Yep, absolutely right. Um, Aaron asked, um, understanding this webinar is focused on consumer and CPG, but how do we see these values shifting in food away from home? Does the desire to eat healthy still hold? Um, anecdotally, I would say yes, absolutely. You're even seeing, uh, in, in many cases, restaurants starting to shift to offering a lot of these alternatives. I mean, um, uh, I live in, in New York City. There's a, a, a pretty famous restaurant called 11 Madison Park. They made some waves recently by going to, you know, kind of a, an, an all plant based diet. Um, I think, you know, I don't know if that's marketing or if that's values driven. I'm not really sure what the motivations were behind that decision. But clearly there's something happening in the air. Um, and clearly that demand is saying to, you know, to, to them that by positioning, you know, this way that they have an ability to rise above the noise of all the restaurants in Manhattan. So there, there's definitely, um, I think, uh, uh, a shift in, in behavior that's happening. The question is, you know, more so how, how do consumers behave and what do they want in, in this space? And so, you know, I know I find it generally harder to eat healthy in a restaurant because you want to order the good stuff. Uh, but I don't know if, if there's any data to support that. So, I, Eric, I don't know if you've seen anything specific there. I know we talked about uh, in one of our last webinars this kind of major shift from, you know, eating out to now eating in because of the pandemic. Um, and now as we are reentering the world, so to speak, uh, you know, that shift is going to go back to the way, you know, it was maybe not all the way, but certainly, you know, uh, I, I think we're going to see a pretty good, um, you know, running of the bulls towards restaurants, if you will. So curious what your thoughts are on this question. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, uh, so I don't have data on the food service space directly the way, the way we do for CBG, but, um, Aaron, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, but, you know, let me just you know, point out the, I think the growth in the fast casual space and the shift in some demand from fast food to fast casual over the years is a, is a big demonstration of this. And not all of them are values oriented. Many of them are positioned as closer to whole food, closer to something I could cook at home. Um, and Chipotle clearly had carved out a, a position for itself in the marketplace in that values space is, you know, focusing quite a bit on their sourcing and their ingredient quality um, and integrity. And they've gone through some challenges and they've navigated them as they've grown. But I do think that there is uh, some of that shift towards more conscious eating. And you could go as far down as, you know, um, uh, consumers. I don't I haven't seen data on just how how much it's being eaten and how many of them have been taken off the menus. But the impossible and, and the, the Beyond Burger finding their way onto so many different uh, fast food restaurant um, sort of menus is is also a demonstration of some amount of reflection of that as a, a business opportunity for those businesses, but also a consumer demand for something a little bit different. So sorry, I don't have much yeah. more depth than those observations, but yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's a great point. I mean, anecdotally, you just kind of look around and you see what's being added to menus and you see that you know, many restaurants, um, predominantly larger, you know, chains are starting to think about what menu items they want to have on, on and available to consumers because, you know, they're seeing there's opportunity, right? Again, I'm going back to this idea that you can open up your addressable market to folks that weren't in your consideration set by thinking about their need states. That's the opportunity, right? It doesn't mean you have to change your entire menu. Yeah, even even at at mid you know sort of mid scale restaurants, you know, eating vegan yeah. or vegetarian, uh, fifteen years ago, even in like in New York, a city like New York, you know, or or San Francisco, it might have meant ordering the vegetable sides from three different entrees in order to have a vegan or vegetarian meal, you know, and and today it's much easier to go into restaurants across the country and have, you know, maybe not something labeled as vegan, but a decent option available that doesn't have meat as the center item. Um, and, and there's a lot more diets that are being accommodated sort of in that mm -hmm. way on, on menus across the board. And so whether that feels like a, in the last two or three years shift, or if you look at it as a, in the past 15 years, we definitely have seen shifts in 
uh, food values uh, being reflected, um, not to mention the at the higher scale restaurants, all the examples of sourcing stories okay. being the important differentiator, you know, of, of course, you know, um, Dan Barber's the best example or one of the best examples of that. But there's a lot of that in every city, um, you know, every major metro, at least, you know, of, of companies doing that, you know, um, growing their own greens, you know, having access, having deep relationships with farmers. And so, yes, I, I think there's a lot of anecdotal evidence of, of these shifts. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Uh, more, more Another kind of anecdotal, you know, story here that, you know, I, I tend to kind of use my, I've said this before on these web, webinars, I, I use my daughter as a proxy for, you know, trends and kind of set, get a sense of kind of where the world is headed. And, you know, I, I, in her peer group, um, you know, she's 13 years old and in her peer group, there are certainly a large number of vegetarians who are 13 years old. And I don't remember a time in history when I was growing up where, you know, there was a popu larger population of children who are also, you know, acting vegetarian. And I, I just find that to be fascinating. You know, you take your your daughter and some friends out for dinner and you gotta be mindful of where you're going because, you know, burger and fries doesn't cut it anymore, right? When you're taking the kids out. And so I think it's all coming down from parents, parenting values, it's matriculating down into the family dynamic. And these kids are, are kind of taking it to heart for whatever reason, whether it's moral, whether it's health, um, and 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 those are the next generation of consumers, by the way. Uh, and I think that 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 in of itself is is somewhat telling, frankly. Yeah. Uh, Liz's okay. question Let's, stands yeah. out to me. I'm I'm yeah. so I wish this was a two way conversation, Liz. I really want to hear uh, your definition of emotional nutrition. She asks, um, how do you see consumers balancing functional tr nutrition yeah. with emotional nutrition? What does that relationship look like? Um, really curious if there's a specific way she's thinking about emotional nutrition on this. Um, it seems like a fun topic. There are so many emotions, as we mentioned, and nutrition conversations happening. It's been really interesting to see, I think, the intuitive eating movement sort of emerge. It's small, but in some ways as a response to consumers becoming more self-aware of how food impacts them and getting to a point where, yeah, maybe I did Whole30, maybe I did vegan, maybe I did vegetarian, maybe I tried all these different dieting techniques. And the biggest benefit I got is an increased sense of self-awareness of how food impacts me to the point now where maybe I have rebuilt this idea of what the connection is between the food I eat and how I feel. And now I can just make choices more intuitively. And I think there's something maybe in that emotional nutrition that she's referencing there. I like... Um, Oh, what is the book? I'm forgetting the book now. There's a, uh, the Dorito effect talks about mm. how we disconnect our association of flavor and smell from actual food and that that erosion because of um, artificial flavors, right? If you think about it, the, the whole premise of the book is when you eat something, you get clues as to what it is you're eating that you pair with the physiological experience of that met my need, my physical need or not. And flake, fake strawberry flavor broke our brain's connection between what strawberries do for me and the smell and taste experience of strawberries to the point now where we don't know the connection between that survey, that strawberry served a purpose for me physiologically and, and I ate that. Anyways, that connection has been broken. And I, I think that. a lot of this emotional and functional nutrition is people reconnecting those things and food still creates barriers to that just a hypothesis. It's a fascinating book. Um, but definitely, I think part of what I'm seeing in sort of the more food aware consumers and what they're experiencing as, as they journey through uh, a much more intentional way of eating in life. Totally. I, I, the, the Dorito effect for me is it kind of sums up that paradox, right? It's the, it, 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 it's the choice between grabbing the handful of Doritos or, or going for the veggies. And I tend to nine out of 10 times choose the Doritos because that's a guilty pleasure of mine. Uh, but it's a good, it's, I, I, just pulled up, I just pulled up the, I think I'm going to order this book, Eric. It sounds fascinating and, and I hadn't heard of it until now. So up until this point, the Dorito effect was a little closer to home. <laughs> so 
so I want to be mindful of, of everyone's time. We're coming up on the hour. There's definitely some more questions uh, uh, that, that we're not going to be able to get to for, for the rest of this session. Uh, but we really, really appreciate you guys joining us. Um, and hopefully you, you know, you learned a thing or two. Uh, it's always a good time when, when Eric and I, uh, chat about this stuff. Uh, we will continue to do this as long as you continue to show up. Um, and we will make sure that, like I said, everyone gets a copy of the materials, uh, and feel free to connect with us directly if you have any further questions or follow-ups uh, that we can be helpful with. Again, I'm Avi Savar from Suzy, and on behalf of myself and Eric Pierce from uh, New Hope, thank you very much for joining us today and spending your Wednesday afternoon uh, talking insights with the two of us. Fabulous. Thanks, Avi. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for adding the questions, too. That's the, that's the most fun. Yeah, the most fun part. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye.